even for Chicago, Saturday, May 19th, 1934, was an unseasonably warm and uncomfortable day, according to the U.S. Weather Bureau. By 4 p.m., the temperature had reached 92 degrees. Less than four inches of rainfall had been recorded since the beginning of the year, amounting to only a third of what was considered normal. The last single rainfall of a tenth of an inch or more had occurred on April 11th, and just 17 one hundredths of an inch had fallen since then. Anyone in their 70s or 80s who had lived all their lives in the city might have thought back to those late summer and early fall days of 1871 and wondered, could we be in for another big one like what we went through in 71? By this time, the Great Depression had been dragging on already more than four years. It had hit the city especially hard with only about half of the Chicagoans who were working and manufacturing in 1927 still employed in that sector by the time Franklin D. Roosevelt was sworn in as president six years later. The Century of Progress World's Fair opened just 10 weeks after Roosevelt was inaugurated in 1933, and it so impressed him with the power to encourage greater spending on consumer goods that he asked Rufus Dawes the principal organizer to extend it for another summer after its November closing. So it was that preparations to reopen the fairgrounds south of the Field Museum and on Northerly Island were almost completed by mid-May of the following year. With dry conditions having continued through winter and into the spring of 1934, the Mile Square Packing House District bounded by Halsted 47th Ashland at Pershing Road that was established almost 70 years earlier as the Union Stockyards had become a virtual tinderbox, particularly in the stock pen area east of Racine Avenue. At about 421 on the afternoon of Saturday, May 19th, with a humidity at around 25 percent and a northeasterly wind blowing at around 15 miles per hour, fire broke out in the cattle pens near 43rd and Morgan, about two blocks west of Halsted Street. According to the official report compiled by the Chicago Board of Underwriters, the fire was in all probability caused by a cigarette discarded from an automobile passing over the frame 43rd Street viaduct. This ignited loose hay in the pens below and fanned by a moderate southwest wind, the flames spread rapidly in all directions, but mainly northeast. Since it was a weekend, packing house workers and most others employed in the vast stockyards complex were taking time off. Watchmen, however, remained on duty to patrol the area. L.W. Preble was one of those who discovered the fire and sent in an alarm from an ADT box in his shanty at 43rd and Morgan. The box he referred to was a watchman's signal that registered in the company office and when verified as an actual fire alarm would then be relayed to the fire department. What was called a snap box also registered in Chicago firehouses that were within the stockyards. Preble wasn't the only stockyards employee to see the fire and send in an alarm. James Fuller Joseph Evans and Patrick Kelly were also nearby and had seen the blaze flare. Kelly, a cattle counter, said he believed it started in the first pen south of 43rd Street, right under the hay dock. In retrospect, whoever saw it first hardly mattered. The wooden pens had been made extremely flammable by the prevailing drought conditions by the elevated frame cattle runways with hay storage sheds above and by the frame viaducts. While only a minute had elapsed between the time the first alarm was sounded at 4.21 p.m. and engine 59 still out of their quarters at 8.26 West Exchange, just a couple of blocks away, all hell had literally broken loose. Fourth Division Marshal John J. Costello shared quarters with Engine 59 and reported that as the engine pulled out, we could see the smoke and flames shooting up in the air. And on arrival at the scene, we found about 300 square feet of the pens ablaze 
with a fire eating into the 43rd Street Viaduct and into the elevated chutes and cattle runs, spreading with considerable speed in every direction. I immediately ordered the first arriving companies to stretch their lines directly ahead of the fire and work streams. At the same time, I saw that the fire had gone beyond the ordinary stage and instantly pulled a 411 alarm. This was all done in less than four minutes after we received the first alarm and would bring in 20 more engines and five hook and ladder companies together with squad wagons, pressure wagons, water towers, ambulances, etc., and also the fire marshal, Michael J. Corrigan, and deputy fire marshal, Anthony J. Mullaney. With the fire leaping over gaps of 50 to 100 feet, and new fires starting up all around us, the main fire was already covering a space of several acres. I went to pull a 511 and a special call for five more engines, which would also bring in Fire Commissioner Arthur R. Seferlich. But by this time, the fire alarm box had burned down and I had to send messengers to the firehouse to send in the additional calls. This would have been about 4.35 p.m. or nine minutes after the 411 was sounded. I then saw that our next stand would have to be made at Dexter Avenue, which runs parallel to Halstead, about half a block to the west, and sent in a special call for 10 more engines, giving orders to send in all engines from the Halstead Street side of the fire. In their report, the underwriter said that by about 4.45 p.m., the fire in the cattle pens, runways, and sheds was out of control, noting that conditions were aggravated by the scarcity of hydrants and problems of accessibility due to the lack of through streets in the area occupied by the pens. Acknowledging Costello's efforts to take a stand in the path of the fire to the northeast along Dexter Park Avenue, the report said, the oncoming wave of heat and flame was of sufficient intensity to cause practically instantaneous involvement of entire buildings in its path. The report further stated that large quantities of water from heavy streams seemed to have no material retarding effect on the fire. By about 5 p.m., freak currents of heated gases and sparks swept over intervening buildings and attacked framed porches at the rear of buildings on the east side of Halston Street, some 660 feet distant. By that time, according to Costello, the wind, which had been an ordinary 20 to 25 mile wind, due to the action of the fire had reached the proportion of a 60 mile gale. And this was practically a gale of living fire, which writhed and swirled and twisted in every direction, seeming to concentrate its terrible, devastating, destroying force on building after building, moving on by leaps and bounds, and absolutely enveloping everything it came into contact with in flame, and almost instantly destroying everything that happened to be in its path. We had the most powerful streams of water which the most up-to-date mm -hmm. fire engines could supply, Costello said. But in most cases, the water was turned into steam before it ever reached the fire and only seemed to add more fuel to the flames. There is one instance that remains firmly implanted in my mind, and I think I will see the picture of it all my life. We had a line of hose going through a driveway through one of the horse barns, and suddenly from the other end, there charged a ball of fire and smoke, filling the entire space and rushing at us with a scream and a roar as though specially bent on our total destruction. We dropped everything and ran, just barely getting away. The inferno that developed late that Saturday afternoon and evening could be seen throughout the city. At first, some treated it as a spectacle, standing along elevated wooden cattle walks in the yards to get a better view as the flames spread. The seriousness of the situation soon became apparent, however, and police began chasing the spectators away. Police also went through the smoke-filled streets east of Halstead
to order families to evacuate homes that were threatened. As sensational stories in the next day's Herald Examiner reported, in the path of the flames, thousands abandoned their homes and domestic possessions and fled to safety. And with an even more dramatic flare, out of the steaming smoke fogged streets came bewildered refugees, half blind from the sting of the fumes, <laughs> half strangled by the thick and steamy atmosphere from which the oxygen seemed to have been sucked. Whole families linked hand to hand to avoid separation emerged from the yellowish haze, groping, stumbling. There were plenty of stories of desperation to tell, even without the dramatic language. Apprehension even gripped the World's Fair, which was set to open the following Saturday, when smoke from a stubborn rubbish fire was mistakenly associated with the stockyard's inferno clearly visible in the distance. That minor blaze was extinguished without great effort by the fair's on-site fire company, which was temporarily listed as the fire department's engine 130. Despite valiant attempts to hold the line against the swirling flames devouring everything in their path north toward Exchange Avenue and east across Dexter Park, a number of sizable buildings seemed to catch fire all at once. Among those consumed were the three-story brick South Exchange Building to the west and to the east along Dexter Park, two-story brick horse barns, and large one-story buildings belonging to the pulverized manure company. Shortly thereafter, the four-story concrete structure housing the Saddle and Sirloin Club, the Stockyards Press, Pollock's Grocery and Market, and the Morris Clothing Factory caught fire. As Costello was trying to establish a new line of defense along Exchange Avenue, the street, he reported later, became impassable it being practically a tunnel of fire. In fact, the fire engine attached to the hydrant in front of engine 59 and all of its hose and equipment went in a blaze of glory. Actually, both engines eight and 14 had been using the hydrant on exchange west of engine 59's house and both were destroyed. Soon after, the firehouse itself was consumed and other structures on the north side of Exchange caught fire, including the Drover's Journal Building, the Omaha Packing Company, the Mercury Manufacturing Company, and the Stockyards National Bank. During this period, several hundred feet of the steel elevated railroad structure west of the Halsted Street Station were left in twisted ruins by the fire. According to the underwriter's report, a remarkable stop deserving of special mention was made by the fire department in sheep shed number two at the southwest corner of Exchange and Texas Avenues, the latter being a narrow north-south lane at about 1050 west. The east portion of this building had become seriously involved and had it not been for the vigorous attack by the fire department, the fire would very likely have spread northward into the most congested portion of the yards, consisting of two rows of framed double deck hog houses, extending continuously for nearly a half mile across the north end. To the south, the fire was stopped just south of the 45th Street Viaduct. Several buildings were destroyed, including a large hay barn and a small part of the pulverized manure company building, but the fire's communication to the larger part of the building was effectively blocked by double automatic fire doors. Directly north of the fire's origin, other buildings were not so fortunate. After the South Exchange building was destroyed, the fire quickly communicated to the structurally fireproof eight-story main exchange building which was the heart of Stockyard's operations. While the building was essentially closed for the weekend, four men had gotten inside, apparently using the building's height as a vantage point to view the conflagration. When the fire actually penetrated the building, cutting off all means of escape, they became trapped on the roof. Their shouts for help were heard by firemen, and they were preparing to jump into the net that had been prepared for them below when a crew manning truck four 
called for them to hang on while they raised their 85-foot aerial ladder. The ladder reached to within three feet of an eighth floor window, leaving about 15 feet between the top of the ladder and the roof. Lieutenant Thomas Morrissey of Engine 65, one of the off-shift members who responded to the fire, climbed to the top of the ladder and entered the building through a window on the eighth floor. He was followed by Fireman Joseph Rezal of Engine 2, John Tebbins of Truck 8, and Robert Quinn of Truck 14, carrying a pompier ladder and a lifeline. Lieutenant Morrissey lifted the pompier ladder and hooked it onto the roof, climbed up and instructed the four men awaiting rescue what they were to do. He then returned to the eighth floor and held the ladder firmly in position while the four men, aided by the firemen, descended to safety. During this time, streams of water were played on the men to protect them from the intense heat and flames radiating from the windows below. Meanwhile, a life net was held in readiness. None of those involved would ever forget the harrowing escape, and it provided Robert Quinn with an experience he could draw upon throughout a career that led to the top job of fire commissioner 24 years later. Among others who advanced to ranking positions after serving at the Stockyards Fire was Jim Hughes, then captain of Squad 9, who later became a second deputy chief fire marshal. On the east side of the fire, the oncoming wave of heat and flame continued to cause practically instantaneous involvement of entire buildings in its path. Structures on the east side of Dexter Park Avenue and the west side of Halsted were consumed so quickly that engines 43 and 98 still attached to hydrants burned on the spot. What were called freak currents of heated gases and sparks swept over intervening buildings and now attacked frame porches behind buildings east of Halstead. In his report, Costello said that by the time we were driven from Exchange Avenue and Dexter Park Avenue, and the fire marshal decided we would have to make our next stand on Halsted Street, being backed by engine companies on Union Avenue, with the entire two blocks on Halsted from 43rd to Root Street being on fire, including the Drover's Bank, the Old Stockyards Pavilion, the Stockyards Inn, and a number of other buildings. It was impossible at this time to predict where it would all end up or what the final outcome would be, Costello said. But the fire marshal kept calling for more companies and always placing them as much as possible directly in front of the fire. And there was just one word passed up and down the line when things looked their worst. And that was carry on, carry on. To give an idea of the spirit displayed by the men, Costello said, I saw one company working in the heart of the flames, their hose of fire on the street almost to the pipe. Finally, their engine went up in a blaze of flame, and without any order from a superior officer, they instantly ran to the nearest engine which was working, pulled off a second line of hose, and after trying to extinguish the fire on this engine, let out a section that was catching on fire and went to work as though it were an everyday occurrence. And at the same time, every man on that company was in need of medical attention. As noted earlier, Costello had called for a 411 at 426 p.m. And besides the initial response of four engines, two trucks, a squad and a high pressure wagon, each level of extra alarms brought five more engines and various other apparatus. After Costello's call for a 511 and three special alarms, at intervals of two to three minutes, starting at 4.35 p.m., most of the 11 other special alarms were ordered by Corrigan with a final call for additional equipment coming at 6.33 p.m. Recognizing the gravity of the situation early on, Corrigan asked radio stations to call upon all available off-duty firemen to report for duty. As awareness of the fire spread throughout the metropolitan area, Assistance also came from neighboring cities and towns. Altogether, 31 suburbs sent men and equipment, mainly to Chicago fire stations, left without pumpers when their apparatus responded to the stockyards blaze. 
Fire companies from Hammond, Joliet, Lake Forest, and Oak Lawn actually worked at the fire itself. Offers of men and equipment came from as far away as Milwaukee, Detroit, and Cincinnati. The city certainly needed extra help because no fewer than 100 of its pumpers served at the fire, along with 12 ladder trucks, all three water towers, four high pressure wagons, and three squads. Other apparatus at the scene included three light wagons, five ambulances, three gasoline supply wagons, and three fire insurance patrol units. 13 of the engines being used had pumping capacity of 1,000 gallons per minute. The rest were 750 gallon rigs. The fire department repair shops were able to deliver five engines along with nine other pieces of apparatus with extra hose to the quarters of engine 29 at 3509 low, where the off shift firemen were dispatched to put them in service. Besides directing off duty firemen to report for work, radio stations were also asked to appeal to Chicago consumers to shut off their lawn sprinklers and to otherwise conserve water supplies since the total pumping rate for the city was near maximum during the time of the fire. The major portion of the water supply for the stockyards area was furnished from the Western Avenue pumping station at 50th Street, where three of the four pumps, each with a capacity of 75 million gallons a day, were in mm -hmm. operation and the fourth pump was ready to be started if needed. At the height of the fire, between 6 and 7 p.m., it was estimated that 50,000 gallons of water per minute were being used. With two engines taking water from almost every hydrant in the area, pumpage throughout the city reached a rate of almost a billion, 307 million gallons a day. When a still alarm was ordered for a fire that had communicated to 43rd and Emerald at 5.13 p.m., Corrigan ordered that companies responding to the 7th and 9th special alarms for the main fire should go directly to that location instead. Another still was called for a communicating fire at 3917 low and box 242 was sounded for a blaze in a vacant factory at 39th and Wallace. With all but 21 Chicago engine companies sent to fight the stockyards fire, Help from suburban companies was certainly needed. A Blue Island engine company operating out of Engine 51's house at 6345 Wentworth responded to three fire calls Saturday night, and so did a Cicero company covering for Engine 16 from its pre-Chicago fire quarters at 23 West 31st Street. Elmwood Park took a couple of runs, filling in for Engine 7 from their house on Belmont at Le Mans. The suburban efforts succeeded in preventing any additional calamities from striking the city while almost its entire fleet of engines was focused on keeping the stockyards fire from spreading. The stockyards fire itself wasn't considered under control until about 11 p.m. Saturday, but wasn't officially struck out until 11.47 p.m. on Sunday, May 20th. After that, a number of fire companies remained on the site for a few days to watch for rekindling and knock down dangerous walls on buildings that had burned. The nearly 31 and a half hour battle severely tested Chicago's firefighting force, burned the equivalent of six square city blocks and caused property losses in excess of $6 million or about 130 million in today's terms. Yet, Thanks to the relentless efforts of the firemen, many of whom responded while off duty or even out of retirement, important buildings were saved, including the Armour and Company General Offices, the Armour, Swift, and G.H. Hammond packing plants, and other buildings west of Racine Avenue. Miraculously, only one fatality was reported. Isaac Means, a stockyards watchman, who was credited with turning in one of the first alarms, could have fled, but stayed to open some of the pens to save hundreds of cattle and lost his life in the process. As it was, more than 800 head of cattle were lost, along with several sheep. Of the estimated 1,600 Chicago firemen who fought the fire, 
54 were reported injured and 24 were taken to hospitals. Treatment was provided on the scene to 132 firemen for burns, eye inflammation, and heat exhaustion. 26 firemen became disabled from drinking unpurified water, and at least 100 others were affected less severely. All the afflicted men were ordered to be inoculated against typhoid. The fast moving pace of the fire cost the fire department itself significant losses of equipment and property. Pumpers assigned to engines 8, 14, 43, 53, 59, and 98 were either badly damaged or destroyed, and engine 59's house was completely consumed. Water Tower 1 and Truck 15 were scorched and damaged, and about 35,000 feet of hose was destroyed. What we saw when the smoke cleared wasn't pretty, but became the subject of a painting that a grateful mayor, Edward J. Kelly, ordered to honor Corrigan and everyone under his command for their service at the fire. This huge allegorical painting, which was created by the Chicago Tribune for a front page tribute to the fire department for its efforts at the fire, hung for many years in the city council chambers and later in fire department offices on the first floor of City Hall. It is now a treasured part of our fire museum collection, along with Corrigan's fire helmet. Corrigan's leadership at the 1934 fire helped convince Mayor Kelly that he should be tapped to become commissioner in 1937, although by then he was required to retire from active service. Corrigan joined the department as the Columbian Exposition was nearing its close in October 1893. He was one of the first to respond to the Iroquois Theater fire in 1903, directed Chicago firemen at the Cherry, Illinois mine disaster in 1909, and took part in rescue efforts at the deadly Stockyards Fire of 1910. As a battalion chief in 1915, Corrigan used an acetylene torch to cut open part of the hull of the capsized pleasure boat Eastland to try to save some of the victims inside. While on fire security duty on opening night of the opera at the Auditorium Theater in 1917, he saw a live bomb tossed down an aisle, ran after it, covered it with his coat and carried it out to the street while snuffing out the fuse, for which he was awarded the Lambert Tree Medal, the city's highest award for heroic duty. The Stockyards Fire of 1934 was certainly his greatest challenge, but far from his last. Corrigan didn't hang up his helmet until March 1955 after some 18 years in the supposedly temporary non-uniform position of fire commissioner and more than 61 years as a Chicago fireman.